Welcome back. In this video, we're going to be talking about two things, right? We're going to talk about outliers, right? And uh, and I'm going to explain what that means and how, like, just really how to investigate that. We're also going to be talking about collinearity, or and sometimes we might refer to multicollinearity, and I'll, I'll explain what that means. If this is your first time to this video series and you are not familiar with uh, with linear regression or multi, multi multiple regression, then go back to the very first video in the playlist. There'll be a link on the screen at the moment and start at the beginning. You may be familiar with linear regression and you're just dipping in because this is the question that you want answered. Fine, in which case, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Now, uh, as always, I only use data sets when working in R that you have access to. So you know that R has got a lot of built-in data sets that you can use for practice. These are the data sets I use so you can repeat the work that I do at home. Also, all of the code and the entire lesson is uh, is available to you uh, as a PDF and you just go at the end of the video, there'll be a card on the screen. You click on the card, it'll take you to a resource library and you can download the PDF of this lesson with the code uh, for free, of course. Okay, let's get stuck in. On this YouTube channel, we're creating our programming videos on everything. So let's start off with outliers. Now, uh, when we talk about outliers, there really are two things we need to talk about. We need to talk about, and maybe I can find a graph just to kind of illustrate what we mean here. If we look at this model in front of us at the moment, when we talk about outliers, we're talking about the residuals, okay? Those residuals that are outside of, of what we might expect or far away from the rest of them. Like the residual is this red line, right? The distance between the observed value and the model. And uh, and we and we you know, we can collect, you know, we can extract all of the residual values and decide which of them are particularly far away from, from what you might expect them to be. So those are what we might think of as outliers, and we'll talk specifically about how do we determine uh, the extent to which uh, we're concerned about them in a second. The other thing that we have to think about when we're talking about these outliers, well, the term outliers in, in, in when we talk about linear, linear regression usually is, is referring to the to the residuals, right? But there are also what we might think of as extreme values. So, in with respect to your x-axis, right? Your your you, you've got some values that are really outside and far away from the rest of them, and those extreme values uh, may well influence the mod the model. When we use the f f with the term influence, we mean that if we took that observation away. Uh, the coefficients of our model would su substantially change, right? So there's two things that we're concerned about. We're concerned about outliers with respect to, uh, with respect to residuals, and we're concerned about extreme values. Now, you can imagine that you can get extreme values that are very, very close to the model. In other words, they've got small residuals, even though they're extreme, and removing them may not make any difference with respect to your model. In other words, they don't have that much influence uh, they wouldn't have that much leverage so to speak so um, let's so with those concepts in mind let's take a look at some examples and let's think this thing through a little bit more carefully so here on the screen you can see we've got uh, we've we, we, we've we've got a plot and by the way this is one of your diagnostic plots that just come that's very easy to get at if we say plot put your model in and you if you just said plot and put your mo model you would get all, all of the diagnostic plots. If you just want to look at one of them, you can ask for a particular number, in this case five, and we get our standardized residuals versus leverage. Now let's just talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, we've got an X and a Y axis, of course. These aren't the absolute values of your your your, your distance, you know, your, your, your X parameters in terms of the, the leverage. And remember, when we say leverage, we're talking about the extent to which the, uh, the 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 values in your data set um, are in you know extreme in other words far away from from everything else uh, and the and the and the, and the residuals are the outliers uh, and when we, so just to reiterate by outlier we mean the outliers of the residuals the residual values um, we've got standardized residuals in other words these aren't the actual values of the residuals they've been they've been standardized so that uh, you, you know, the 95% of the values will fit in within two standard deviations, uh, a, 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 as you know, sort of a normal distribution. So n most of the value should sit between 
uh, 2 and negative 2. And we often use, some people use 2, some people use 3, depending on what kind of analysis you're doing, as a cutoff. In other words, you might, as a cutoff for what you'd consider to be an outlier. Um, uh, so it's above or below two usually, at, but then some people might use three for different kinds of data and different kinds of analysis. Um, and, and then you've got these leverage points that are out here. Now, and there, and now the thing to remember is that the outliers that you're interested in are, and let's have a look at, this is a nice example here. Things that are have got a high leverage, in other words, uh, all the way out on the right-hand side. So there's high leverage. In other words, they're extreme extreme values in our in our data set, but and that also are, are outside of uh, what we'd consider to be two standard deviations for your your standardized residuals. So these these figures up here, in this case, it's the empty cars I think data set. So your Chrysler really represents kind of a, a, a problem that might have a lot of influence. Um, but and and then but these other ones out here, they've got lower leverage, but they are. Uh, really kind of significant uh, uh, outliers, you may look into them and, and, and de determine the extent to which they have influence. In other words, if they were removed, the extent to which they would impact on the coefficients of your model. Uh, the important thing to do is to, whenever you find outliers, is to look at that data point and try to understand why it is an outlier. There might be something interesting in there. There might be some important reason why that data point really should be part of the model that you know it and 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 shouldn't be removed so you need to really apply your expert knowledge on the subject matter to make a decision as to whether or not a particular outlier is removed from your data set uh, in creating your model okay so that that's outliers and now we're going to talk about collinearity and multi multicollinearity right when we talk about collinearity and multicollinearity like collinearity when I use the term, I mean we're talking about two variables, two of the explanatory variables, um, and multicollinearity if there's more than two. Okay, but really what we're talking about is the fact that we know that these variables are linearly, linearly, sorry, I can't pronounce the word, related to the outcome variable, right? But if they are correlate, strongly correlated with each other, in other words, it's a linear relationship between each other, then we may want to remove one of them from the model because they might be telling the same story and telling it twice. And we we do want a model that has as fewer explanatory variables as possible. We don't want an overfitted model. Let's have an example that'll it'll make it a little bit clearer. Um, and here we've got our MT cars data set. Uh, we've ex we're looking at miles per gallon, so fuel efficiency, and there's displacement and horsepower, both of which are if we look, if we do a little correlation test here, and I, so I've just piped it into correlation test and I've piped that into round two just so that we've only got two decimal points and this thing doesn't look too messy. Um, really, we, we, we can see that both uh, displacement and horsepower um, are, well, it's, it's in, in both cases, it's a negative, cor negative correlation, but strongly correlated. Uh, so anything in a correlation coefficient, anything above 0.7 is, is a real strong correlation, strongly correlated with, um, negatively correlated with MPG, miles per gallon, in other words, fuel efficiency. Interesting. But we also see that they are strongly correlated with each other. So displacement um, is, got, is, is correlated, you know, uh, 0.79, nearly 0.8 with horsepower. Okay, so... The thing that we start worrying about is like, are these these two variables really kind of telling the same story, and we might want to exclude one of them from 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 the, from the analysis. In a previous video, I talked about how it is that we select variables, so I'm not going to r r go into that again. But there, there are there's a very very specific methodology that you can apply to decide which variables you keep and which ones you don't keep in a model. The reason I wanted to talk about co collinearity is because there are exceptions. In other words, just because two variables are collinear, it doesn't mean that you necessarily want to remove remove one of them from the model. You need to, once again, apply your expert knowledge uh, to the situation and make an informed decision about what you do, because it might be that uh, the, you know, the, the, the variable that you may have otherwise removed is important for some sort of theoretical reason. So uh, an example of when you might want to keep a what seemingly a, a correlated uh, extra, uh, uh, explanatory variable in is where we have the idea of confounding. So 
the nice thing about uh, linear regression is it's a way to control for confounding. So, you know, we know that all of our coefficients are the extent to which this particular variable impacts on the outcome variable, all else being kept equal. And so you can you can keep your confounding variables uh, static while you look at the just the effect of a particular explanatory variable. And that can be very important in your analysis. Now, what do we mean by confounding? Let me quickly explain what confounding means. Confounding is often an alternative explanation for a relationship between uh, an exposure and an outcome. So let's imagine, for example, that we are um, selling ice cream and we notice that uh, we, we also notice that there seems to be a relationship between ice cream sales and shark attacks. Uh, so there's a positive correlation between selling ice cream at the beach and shark attacks. Now you could incorrectly draw the make a conclusion that that's a causative relationship, right? We, you may incorrectly assume that selling ice cream causes an increase in shark attacks because the two, you know, the one is very strongly correlated with the other. What you need to keep in mind is that there's sometimes a confounding variable. So a confounding variable is related to both ice cream consumption and heart and and shark attacks. Um, but isn't on the causal pathway. So in this particular instance, it might be hot weather. So if it's a hot day, there are more people on the beach, and so ice cream sales go up. But on a hot day, more people are swimming in the sea, and so shark attacks go up. So ice cream sales themselves, while they are strongly correlated, right, with increase in shark attacks, are not causative. In fact, it's just the case that ice cream sales are strongly correlated with an increase uh, with, with hot weather and hot weather is uh, associated with more swimming and more swimming is associated with increased shark attacks. And so, and so you need to have both of the, you need to have the, the weather, uh, shark attacks uh, and ice cream sales all in your model in order to kind of see, see that relationship, if that makes sense. So that's called confounding. And, um, and, and so if there is a suspicion of confounding, you need to keep uh, that variable in the model, even if there is uh, an increased correlation. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Um, in the next video, we are going to talk about effect modifiers and interactions. Okay, thanks. For, uh, by the way, uh, the PDF of this can be found. Uh, there's a link on the screen at the moment. Click on the link. You can download the PDF and... Um, uh, and, and, and follow on at home. And of course, as, as is always the case, all the data that I use in the examples are available on in R. Okay. Okay. Thanks for watching. Speak to you soon. Take care. Bye.